So let me just begin by saying I want to really thank the organizers for inviting me to what's been just a really interesting conference. I've learned lots, and I look forward to learning a lot more. So what I want to talk about today is risk and research. Excuse me, just a minute. This isn't, the slides aren't advancing. Oh, here it is. No, it didn't. Now we'll try. I think it's on. Okay? So, just by way of introduction, a basic tenet of economics is that the private sector underinvests in risky research if left to its own devices. There are at least two reasons, both spillovers to other firms and the time horizon necessary to recoup the investment can discourage the private sector from investing in risky research. Yet, risky research is essential to advancing the knowledge frontier. Hence, it's argued that the government has a major role in supporting risky research with higher variance and a mean of outcome. So, for example, Richard Nelson has written about this and Kenneth Arrow wrote about this. And also, individuals working in the nonprofit sector are looked to as a source of risk taking. And I think this is more important today than it was 65 years ago, because one could argue that short termism on the part of companies is leading them to do less basic research and less risky research. So if you just look at the work of Ashish Arora, <coughs> um, who looked at the percent of US firms that are engaged in publishing R&D firms, we see a dramatic decline over the last 30 years. So at the time this is happening, there's also a perception among scientists and policymakers that the appetite for risk taking among public funding agencies has declined or is absent, that rewards discourage research, um, re that the rewards to research discourage risk taking, and that these trends may be growing. Just consider what James Rothman said, I believe, and this was on NPR the day after he shared the Nobel um, Prize in Physiology or Medicine in, 19, in 2013. He told an interviewer that he was grateful that he started to work in the early 1970s when the federal government was willing to take much bigger risk in handing out funding to young scientists. And he went on to say, I had five years of failure, really, before I had the first initial success. And I'd like to think that that kind of support existed today, but I think there's less of it and it's actually becoming a pressing national issue, if not an international issue. So this isn't unique to biomedical research. A geophysicist at a major US university, um, when I um, did an interview with him um, fairly recently, speaking of NSF said, programs are not very adventurous. And what I experienced was that I couldn't get any new idea or anything I was really excited about funded by NSF. It never worked. The feedback is, well, this is too new. We don't know whether it's going to work. So this raises several questions. First, do scientists working in the nonprofit sector engage in risky research? Does the public sector support risky research? If not, why? And then there were the, there's the related question of whether risk aversion on the part of funders and scientists is increasing. So these are challenging questions to address. I mean, first of all, there's this naughty measurement question. I mean, first of all, how do you measure risk associated with proposals or published papers not to mention what we could call the file drawer problem, that a lot of things that may fail never see the light of day 
so we simply don't have a paper trail to study them. And then I think it's very important to think about the fact that the meaning of risk varies depending upon where one's sitting or where one's role is. Funding agencies arguably see risky research through what we could think of as kind of a financial lens of high risk, high gain, which as we saw from Carl Bergstrom's slides yesterday is the motto of the European Research Council. And then on the other hand, I think review panels arguably focus on the downside associated with risk. They're much, you can think of, or I think in many ways, they're much like insurance agencies, where they see their role as insuring against funding proposals that may fail. So they focus less on a higher expected mean and more on this probability of failure. And then researchers see gain associated with risky research, but they also have very serious career concerns regarding consequences associated with failure, especially consequences in the short run. So um, in my remaining time, I want to focus on three topics. First of all, how rewards to science discourage risk-taking on the part of scientists. Then I want to present one measure of risk associated with research. And then I'll spend just a few minutes investigating the extent to which the European Research Council funds individuals with a history of risk taking based on this measure. So let me begin by talking about how, the re how rewards and the structure of careers discourage risk taking. Now some of these things I'm gonna talk about are specific to the US, but most of them are very generalizable to other um, places. So to begin with, I think there's what we could call, um, to use Stephen Quake, a biophysicist here at Stanford's um, phrase, there's the funding or famine phenomena. So an increasing proportion of scientists in the nonprofit sector, particularly universities, are working in soft money positions. And medical schools in the United States are a perfect example of this. I'll give you some data about this in just a minute. And this really means if you're in a soft money position, you've absolutely got to have funding in order to cover your salary. You're not going to, to use Stephen Quake's term, eat um, without funding. So this certainly discourages engaging in research with a significant probability of failure or for which the rewards are gonna take a long enough time to be realized that you can't really capture them in the short run. So just to give you some idea, NIH estimates that principal investigators receive 50% of their annual salary from grant funding. Now many, many of these principal investigators are entirely on soft money. In 35% of medical schools in the United States, tenure is accompanied by absolutely no financial gain for basic science faculty. In 52%, tenure is accompanied by specific financial guarantee, but only in 13% is this um, equal to the institutional salary. And if you look at the Harvard Medical School, only 140 of the Harvard medical faculty are actually Harvard employees. The rest are hospital employees, and by inference on soft money positions. Another way in which the reward system, I think, discourages risk taking is what I call the quad or the quadruple effect. So let me explain what I mean here. What I mean by this is that the rewards attached to highly risky research are not commensurate with the, with the potential loss arising from failure. And I borrow this analogy from figure skating. I mean, in the last Olympics, it was pointed out that every male who won in the figure skating are placed executed a quad successfully and that no female who won in figure skating attempted a quad. Um, a triple was what they attempted and, they, and did successfully to win. And when discussing why this was so, somebody said, well, it's all the rewards. The scoring is different for men than it is for women, and the gap between a quadruple and a triple is very large for males, and it's not very large for women. So, you take a great risk if you try to execute a quad if you're a woman, 
and the gain is not that much. Well, this is consistent with some of the research that people have done suggesting that the risk of doing something really different um, overcomes the benefit that's there. So if you just look at the work that Jacob Foster um, talked briefly about um, earlier in this conference about new chemical combinations, well, he and his co-authors examined the extent to which chemists introduce novel chemicals and chemical relationships using network analysis, as you know. And to quote, um, take a quote from one of their findings, an innovative publication is more likely to achieve high impact than a conservative one, but the additional reward does not compensate for the risk of failure to publish. I mean, that's very much like a quad effect. The risk is, is more than the benefit. And it's consistent with the concept that the traditional path is a reliable course for accumulating recognition and that rewards can discourage risk taking. And um, Foster and his colleagues also find a growing focus on established knowledge. And this is consistent with the idea that risk taking is declining. Or if you look at the work that Brian Uzi and colleagues have done on atypicality, where they characterize um, an article's um, atypicality by looking at the reference combinations in it and um, by looking at um, how these combinations score on a z-score. So for an individual paper, they take the lowest 10th percentile commonest score of its series of commonest scores as an indication of its novelty and the medium commonest score as an indication of how conventional it is. And then if you look at eight-year citation patterns, what they find is that the highest impact science is primarily grounded in exceptionally conventional combinations of prior work. It takes a little novelty at the tail, but an awful lot of conventionality to get a disproportionate increase in citations. So it suggests that you, know, you can take on a little bit of risk, but not that much. Another way in which I think um, career structure and rewards discourage risk taking is what I like to call the ice cube effect. That reputation can be compromised by proposing risky research. So for those of you who don't know, um, ice cube is a neutrino observatory and it's constructed in Antarctica. And it has these sensors, these domes that are distributed over a cubic kilometer and a depth to a mile to about a mile and a half. Each one of these domes has 60 light detectors. Well, the Ice Cube um, Neutrino Observatory was the brainchild of Francis Halson, who's an astronomer at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and to hear Halson describe this and how he came to this um, was that he had been thinking about this idea for quite a bit of time. Um, and he was concerned about sharing this idea with others, thinking that other astronomers might think that this was really a kind of crazy notion and something, a path that shouldn't be taken. And then he says that he was invited to a rather obscure conference in Eastern Europe. This is before the wall came down, before the internet was functioning. And he said, I decided that if I'm ever going to talk about this idea, this is the perfect place to talk about it. There are not big reputational effects here. Well, it was very enthusiastically received, and he went on to propose to NSF to get funding for this, and it's a big functioning facility today. But if you think about this, the speed of diffusion has increased dramatically in recent years. So 40 years ago, it would have taken a little bit of time, quite a bit of time, for everybody in this community to know about this. But today, that would be known almost instantly. And then I think there's the issue that citation practices and the availability of citation data discourage risk taking. If you consider what Richard Catlow, um, the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, wrote in Nature soon after he became the Foreign Secretary, he said, I was lucky. When I began my scientific career in the 1970s, I had no real sense of how my work was cited. My discipline, computational materials chemistry, was basically 
was barely acknowledged by mainstream chemists. If I had been citation-driven, I might have abandoned a field that is now central to developing a number of things, but, 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 um, but by the 1990s, when citation data became prominent, I was already a full professor. I think more generally, and I'll show you some evidence about this, short-term bibliometric indicators discourage risk-taking. So this is consistent with some research I've done with Hilda Villager and Jean Wang um, at KU Leuven, in which we show that novel research, which has properties associated with risk-taking, takes longer to show up bibliometrically and have impact. So let me just tell you a little bit about how we create this measure. Our novelty measure builds on the combinatorial view of knowledge creation, where researchers work with pieces of knowledge and they combine them to generate new knowledge. And you can think of one view where you have exploitation, where you use knowledge pieces in well-understood ways, or exploration where you use some existing knowledge in new combinations. And I think it's fair to say that explorative research is more likely to lead to breakthroughs than exploitative research. So what we do is we create a measure of novelty of papers based on references. And for um, we collect data in 2001 of all publications because we want to look at the citation history. And we construct co-cited journal pairs and we check to see if the pair has been made before in the last 20 years. And if the pair is, um, um, if it's novel, we then look at how difficult it was to make this novel combination by looking at how um, many common friends it has. And we sum these together to create a novelty score. So what we find of the 661,000 papers that were published and indexed, on the web of science in 2001, that 89% have no novel combinations. And then for the 11% that do, we split them into the tail and call those highly novel and the others moderately novel. And so what do we find? Well, we find the mean, um, that the mean is higher and that there's more dispersion for highly novel papers. This is consistent with the idea that these papers um, have characteristics associated with risk. We also find that dispersion is driven by both tails, that these highly novel papers are more likely to be cited in the top, but they're also more likely to be cited in the bottom. In other words, that they've failed in that sense. And then we find considerable delayed recognition, and I think this has big career effects in the sense that these highly novel papers, this is the probability of being typesighted, they do very well in the long run compared to the um, non-novel papers, but it takes a while for them to show their stuff. And we also find that they're published in journals of lower impact. Um, we don't know whether that's due to selection on the part of the authors or judgment by um, the journal editors, but that's where they appear. So these novelty findings suggest that short-term bibliometric measures really discourage risk-taking, yet you know, such measures are used extensively in hiring, in third-year review, in promotion, and a lot of funding decisions where panel members just sit there and look up people's um, citation counts. And particularly for young researchers, these are very short-term bibliometric measures. So another topic we could ask ourselves is do funders avoid taking risk? And so um, having created this measure of novelty, we were interested in looking at the extent to which the European, the European Research Council funds researchers with a history of novel research. So for those of you who don't know, the European Research Council is a program within the EC, and it provides funding for basic research. It was set up in 2007, um, and it was considered to be the instrument for kind of bottom-up individual researchers. It's pretty sizable. Its budget for the last six years has been 13 billion euros. 
Um, and it was explicitly designed to, re, to fund high risk, high gain research. Its mission statement says that scientific excellence is the sole selection criteria. In particular, high risk, high gain pioneering proposals, which go beyond the state of the art, address new and emerging fields of research, and introduce unconventional innovative approaches are encouraged. So it supports research in all fields of science and humanities. Um, it has 25 panels, nine in the life sciences, 10 in the physical sciences, six in the social sciences and engineering. And it has um, three types of grants, grants for what are called starters. Starters are people who've been out two to seven years, um, consolidators, people who've been out seven to 12 years since their PhD, and then advanced individuals. And when um, evaluating advanced, only the last 10 years of their CV is looked at. It also funds what are called synergy grants. So the selection process um, begins by the European, uh, by the ERC Council, which is made up of about 26 very eminent scientists um, selecting panel members. And then panel members are brought to Brussels and during orientation they're informed of the ERC's mission to promote high risk, high gain research. I was recently on one of these synergy panels and they took quite a bit of time talking to us about how this was their goal. And panel members make all the decisions about who gets a grant. So the review is done in two stages. In stage one, um, panel members get a five-page summary of the research and the proposer's CV. Um, and panel members write these. That they're sent a panel meeting. And if it passes through that, the, um, the person moves on to what's called stage two. And at stage two, the review is based on a 15-page proposal. The 15-page proposal was written at the same time as the short five-page abstract, but not looked at until stage two. And it's also sent to external reviewers. And then the panel decides who to invite for interviews, and interviews occur at stage two for starter grants and for synergy grants. So, what we wanted to know is whether the ERC that claims to want to support risky research in some sense, whether there's any evidence at all that the ERC is funding people who have a history of doing risky research. And so we use our measure of novelty, which is um, associated with risk in some sense, to proxy for this. And our sample is all applicants who are successful plus a sample of those who were unsuccessful. There have been over 60,000 applicants since the program was started. So we don't use all of the applicants, but we have a sample of the ones who were not successful. And we estimate the probability of being selected both at stage one and at stage two. And we're particularly interested as for explanatory variables whether the researcher has at least one novel paper in its pre-application stock, and whether the researcher has at least one top-sided article. And we have a number of controls in what we do. So what do we find? Well, we find that applicants with a history of novel research are less likely to be supported. I mean, we can reject the hypothesis that there's no relationship in favor of the hypothesis that people who have a history of novel research are less likely to be funded. But this finding is for starters, and it's for these early career individuals. We don't find this for the more advanced people. And I think it's consistent with this idea that panels in some sense are ensuring against failure that they're worried about this. Um, if you look at our, these are fairly small, but perhaps you can see them. We find that, the, that this negative relationship between novelty and getting the grant, um, which dominates for starters, 
occurs at stage one when people are just looking at the spy page proposal and the CV and are focusing, I think, quite extensively on bibliometrics, we don't see the effect if they progress to stage two. But stage one is a dominant effect, is so dominant that it's highly predictive of whether they get funding. As I said, we don't see this for advanced applicants. On the other hand, we see no evidence that, um, that the ERC is supporting advanced people who had a history of taking risk. There's, um, you can't reject the null hypothesis that there's no effect. Our findings are fairly consistent with the work of Kevin Boudreau and co-authors. If you're not familiar with this work, I would encourage you to look at it. It's in Management Science that came out a couple of years ago where they run an experiment at the Harvard Medical School. There's a six-page proposal that's randomly assigned to reviewers. And then they examine the relationship between evaluations and novel departures from existing research paradigms and pathways. And their measure of novelty is um, by, they create this measure by examining medical subject terms, combinations in the proposal, and then they compare these to pairs in the entire existing literature in PubMed to capture the fraction of pairs that have not yet appeared. And they find a very, very um, significant and large negative relationship between the evaluation score and the proposal novelty. And so this is consistent, again, I think, with the view that reviewers are biased against novelty, suggesting that in some sense they're risk averse or they're acting as ensuring against failure on the part. And I should just say as an aside, for um, three years I served on the advisory council for GM, um, that's general medicine at NIH, and I was very aware when I was on that council how much concern there was that we not fund things that might fail. You know, that was a lot of discussion went in that direction. So just by way of summary, risk taking in science is rare. I think there's some evidence that it is decreasing. I think the reward system and structure of, of careers discourage risk taking, that there's some evidence that review panels avoid risky research measured by novelty, at least at the ERC. This is for early career researchers. And it's consistent with the idea that panels, rather than looking at the upside associated with research, focus on ensuring against failed research. So in my um, remaining minutes, um, I'd like to just briefly talk about ways to encourage risk taking. First of all, wearing a funder's hat. Um, I think the number one thing, at least in the US, would be to disallow indirect um, recovery on salary, okay? I think it would really discourage soft money positions. In other places, I've written about the shopping mall model that I think occurs at universities, where universities build buildings and encourage people to come and work in these buildings on soft money, and they rent it off out to them, basically, on the indirect that they're getting from the salary that um, they're earning. I think we need to definitely place less emphasis on preliminary results at review. And then I think it's important to restructure the way funding is awarded and packaged. Think about having grants of longer duration. You have time to recover if something goes wrong. We need to put more emphasis on people rather than projects. And this was mentioned yesterday, I think, by James Evan. Uh, funding groups provide some insurance in some sense. Think about Bell Labs, where it was the group um, that was accountable and not individuals. And we need to experiment, I believe, with alternative review processes. Um, we don't want to have a system, I think, where unanimity rules. What about golden tickets, where every reviewer gets to choose at least one regardless of what other people think, that thinks it's worthy of funding. I think um, it's important for panels to be educated towards a portfolio perspective. 
that they're really choosing a portfolio and not just choosing fail, fail, fail probability, but to think about the spread. And I think the discussion on lotteries yesterday was very interesting. Now, in terms of ways to encourage risk-taking at universities, and this is my last slide, I think it's absolutely essential that universities place less emphasis on short-term bibliometrics in hiring and promotion decisions. I think that's a very hard um, cultural norm to change, but I think we really need to work on it. And a very actionable item is that I think it's important for universities um, to have small amounts of funding available for faculty who have innovative, risky ideas that you, all you have to do is write a two or three page proposal and have it looked at by a small group or one or two people at the university and be given funds to try to work on this idea. Um, Caltech has had such a program and I think it's been very successful for them. And I think it may be much more important to get funding closer to scientists and allow scientists to um, explore um, without having to commit uh, hours, days to writing proposals and um, to move forward that way. So I'll end there. Um, thank you and I look forward to questions. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Hart. I'm in psychology at Florida State University. Uh, and having sat on review panels myself, I've sometimes in my head had this feeling like, oh my gosh, we're going to give $1.5 million you know, to this idea. And uh, does it reach that level? So like the money amount almost kind of gets in the way. Have, do you think that there's anything about that, that we might be more willing to fund higher risk research if it was less total money? Well, I think these, these, um, this fund that I was talking about at Caltech mm -hmm. and other places I think is consistent with that. You're putting one to $200,000 into an idea, not 1.5 million. And at the ERC recently when I was on the Synergy panel, I forget, but I think it's, I think it's, I think it's up to 8 million euros. It's a lot of money. And I think that was definitely on the table um, and when people talked about not being sure they would get results, this was definitely part of the calculus. So, but I think that's much, I mean, in a sense, that's like an insurance, right? You don't want to give this huge amount of money um, if there's a probability of failure. Mm -hmm. So I do think that um, the, how much is involved is an important aspect of it. <clears throat> yes. Hi, Jonathan Schooler, UC Santa Barbara. Uh -huh. um, I, I very much like the idea of uh, portfolios, and I'm wondering if, uh, if it's been looked at on the side of the uh, researchers themselves. So one seemingly reasonable strategy would be to have a diversified portfolio as a researcher where you have your blue chip projects, but also always maintaining some more high risk uh, junk bond type projects. Yeah, I think that's, no, I, I think that's a, an excellent point. And I think if you talk to researchers, a number of them will say that they do have that kind of mentality and that they're working on the blue chip idea kind of on the back burner with support for the sure wins on, or, you know, the safe bets, um, kind of funding it. Um, but I think particularly when you get into soft money positions, it's very, very hard for people to even think about blue chips. I mean, that's, um, they just don't have the time, I think, to do it. They're spending a great deal of time writing proposals and don't have the time. And I think for early career scientists, there's so much at risk. You've got to make third year, you've got to get hired, you've got to make third year review. Um, that it's very hard to begin to develop that portfolio till later. Thank you. So Paula, that was marvelous. Um, oh, Carl Bergstein, University of Washington. Yeah, hiding over here. Uh, so, 
So um, I completely agree with your, uh, you know, analysis of the sort of mental frame of, of review panels as ensuring against against failure. That's totally consistent with my experience. I never thought I would stand up within spitting distance of Sand Hill Road and tell 300 people that we should start emulating VC culture. But that said, they are, you know, almost comically doing the opposite, uh, going for the 100x and everything else can fail fast. It's only making 3x. We're not interested. What can we do, if anything, what should we do, if anything, to import aspects of that decision-making model into scientific funding? Well, I think, I think first of all, it's really important to remind reviewers about the whole idea of why we're funding research as a government particularly. I'm talking about NIH and NSF here. I think a lot of reviewers totally lose sight of the rationale that brought the funding to the table and don't think about the portfolio at all and don't think about the fact that they need to invest at least part of it on the long, on the long shot, right? And that discussion, at least, and I've sat on lots of NSF panels and been at NIH for quite a bit of time, that discussion just doesn't occur at the panel meeting. Nobody talks about that. And instead, you hear this great concern, and I do think it's a concern. If I, if I was Francis Collins, I'd be really worried about it, that if we fail big and spend a lot of money on this, that the first thing I'm going to hear on the Hill is how could you have wasted our resources? But we don't say that to these other companies, right, to companies, right? We don't think about it as a waste. We think about it as investing in a shop. Just very quickly, is it because we can more easily value the successes and weigh them against the costs in VC land? <coughs> Maybe. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Okay. Hi, <clears throat> Steve Goodman, uh, Stanford. Uh, you didn't mention, or maybe I missed it, the dynamic in terms of the size of the workforce. As as you're aware, you know we we have an unsustainable system where Absolutely. you know professors are training many more trainees than the system can actually absorb. So they're being trained for jobs that don't exist. But even as we expand the workforce, they're chasing uh, you know less money per. Uh, per scientist, and this makes them the collectively and individually more risk averse. And yet, if you increase the research funding, this increases the number of positions that are made available in the universities because they think they're chasing a larger pool. So, how does the size of the workforce affect this, and how do we adjust that to maximize, uh, you know, oh. long-term investment? Well, workforce is an issue that I spend an awful lot of time thinking about. And um, at least for, for many years, for over 20 years, it's certainly been well known that the biomedical system is totally out of equilibrium in the US, that we have a system that keeps, gener that keeps generating more trainees than can possibly find positions in research, and it's been growing. And I think this puts a lot, if going back to Carl's talk yesterday, it puts a lot of this pressure on the increased number of proposals and the increased um, and, and the decreased odds of getting funding. I also think it's put, I, I like to talk about get out of jail free cards, that if you're a postdoc working in a lab, that your get out of jail free card is an article in science or nature, right? And so people are investing a lot in trying to get in those things. And it's, it's I mean, I think we've gotten a system and I believe this is very much the way in which universities are structured, in which we um, staff labs with postdocs and graduate students rather than with staff scientists um, that would add some stability to the system and might create a whole different culture um, and um, dynamic. And it's been very, very hard to change that. I've been on three National Academy committees that have made recommendations about how to go about changing this, but there's a lot of resistance out there to change in that respect. But I think it's definitely contributed to this lack of risk taking. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, Alexa Tullett, University of Alabama Psychology. Um, so as a social psychologist, I guess I've come to believe that within, within my field that risky research maybe has become overvalued. Um, and so I think we've spent a lot of time as a field pursuing effects that are, are very small or are non-existent. And so I guess I'm wondering, um, how do you know like at what point funders and other sort of like institutions that are setting research agendas or influencing them might be justified in discouraging that kind of risk taking? Well, first of all, I think you raised a really interesting point that much of what I say may be very field dependent mm -hmm. and topic dependent. So I shouldn't make any generalizations for what I'm saying. But when you say that you, you describe it as risky, but you also say small effects. So in a sense, that seems to be a contradiction to me. Um, oh. Do you want to elaborate on that? Maybe, maybe there's a difference in the way that we're using the terms risky. So I'm, I'm using the term risky. I, was, I thought that I understood that you were using the term risky as meaning like things where we don't know whether it's the case or not. And I think that we generally are, are un more unsure for smaller effects. You think you're more unsure for smaller effects? Yeah. Well, I, th I think that's an, um, an interesting hypothesis to test. <laughs> okay. I'm not, so, I'm not so sure about that, but I think in a sense when I'm thinking about risk, I'm thinking about a large variance of outcomes where you have a tail that has a low probability, but if it works out, there'll be a significant impact. Right, um, okay, so you're okay. looking for unlikely large effects? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's how I'm thinking about risk in a financial terms, if you okay. think about, okay? And I think you're thinking about the probability of getting a, a small effect um, may not be that great, and people are, people are maybe mining fields that have been overmined. Is that what you're saying? Uh, <laughs> trying to get just a little bit more out of the bank. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Over here. Hi, uh, I'm Alan Ransel from uh, MIT and Protocol Labs. Uh, does the research you presented imply that graduate students' incentives are misaligned with later career or more established advisors? And so they should choose early career advisors? That they should choose what? I didn't hear you. Early career advisors, because those advisors are, are sort of incentivized differently in terms of how risky the projects they want their, their lab to pursue are? Well, I think, I think the way the system is now, early career advisors um, cannot afford to take a lot of risk compared to people who at least have a longer term window at least in terms of the bibliometrics, and in, if you look at our ERC findings, that's certainly suggestive of that. So in a sense, that means that aligning yourself with a, this is clearly speculative at this <laughs> point, okay? This is not advice for everyone at this point. But I think it suggests that aligning yourself with somebody um, as a graduate student, an early career person, <coughs> Um, who doesn't have the resources to be able to take the long run view or a longer run view could be a bit risky for yourself. Sure, yeah. But, okay. But but is there is there a risk that if you need sort of early wins that are more incremental, that if your your advisor has sort of a portfolio of high risk projects and out of ten graduate students, two of them do really well and eight don't get anything because they, they're okay. incentivized to do Okay, on that respect, you should go with the, with the younger advisor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I would agree. Okay, put words in my mouth, okay? Have a great lunch. <laughs>